Amen. Amen. Tell your neighbor, let's get into God's Word. Pull out your notepad, pull out your phone, your notes area. Uh, get your Bible in your hand. We're about to dive into the Word of God. And I believe the Lord wants to speak something to you today. Um, it is only I that has this opportunity to be used by God in this moment because the Lord just sees fit to use those in whom he calls. There's nothing special uh, about the calling. There's something special about the yielding. And so God uses those who yield themselves to his work and his calling. And I believe today that God is going to speak to you today. Tell your neighbor, God's got a word for you. Genesis chapter 45, that's where we are today. We are in the middle of the story of Joseph. And I believe that it is important as we talk about embracing necessary endings, that we speak to the season of where Joseph has lived through the trauma of being neglected, being sold, being discarded, all while having a vision from God that he's called to make a difference. I don't know if you've been there before, but some of you don't understand is that you've been called, but what it feels like in the moment that you're in is that your calling is invalid. You may feel like you're in a pit situation because of what your bank account looked like or what, what your relationship status looks like at the moment or, or where you feel you are in life. But can I tell you, the pit of where you are is only a season to what God is bringing you into. And I believe this to today is that if you would not get bogged down by the details of today, but to look forward to the vision that God has over your life, you would see that God's got a plan for your life today. Where we pick up in chapter 45 is that Joseph is, has come from the place of being sold by his brothers into slavery, into Egypt. And the Bible gives us clarity that everywhere that Joseph goes, he has favor. I don't know if you've ever been there before, but sometimes you feel like the enemy is constantly attacking you, but you also feel the favor of God at the same time. Anybody ever been there before? You know God is moving even though things don't seem like they are where they're supposed to be. And that's where Joseph is. Joseph has been sold into slavery by people that are close and dear because sometimes the greatest trauma in our life is caused by the people most closest to us. It's the people that said they'll be there. It's the people that said, I've got your back. It's the people that started with you but didn't finish. Sometimes the closest individuals are the reason for your trauma. The Bible lets us know that as Joseph is sold into slavery, he's sold into the house of a man by the name of Potiphar. And, and while Joseph is trying to do good, he is tempted with evil. And Potiphar's wife is trying to get with Joseph, and Joseph is like, man, if you don't get her, I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to, anybody ever been there? You keep telling the Lord, Lord, I need you to move this temptation because I'm trying my best, but my will, anybody know your will is weak? That's for the real people. The spirit is willing, but the Bible says, but the flesh is weak. We don't get all of the story of Joseph. We just know that he did not yield to temptation. The Bible says after being cast out of Potiphar's house, he was cast into jail, and, and it says, and he was given favor that he was over all the prisoners. It's weird when you're going through trials, but God's still promoting you. You don't understand why there's elevation. You don't understand why you got the phone call. You don't understand why they reached out to you. But what you know is that even in the trauma or the misery or the broken moment, God is still working on your behalf. The Bible says he gives them favor and Joseph has favor in jail. There's something about having favor in the place that you feel like you want to quit from. The Bible says he gives them favor. 
Joseph tells the dream of the baker and the cupbearer. And then you've been ministering to everybody else. You've been pouring in to everybody else. But it seems like God has left you on the side. You've been helping everybody else get their stuff together. You've been pouring into everyone. You've been making sure everybody's got their stuff taken care of. But anybody ever notice you feel neglected as you're pouring out to everybody else? The Bible says years go past that Joseph is forgotten about. But God. Joseph has an opportunity to give a dream to Pharaoh and interpret his dream. And the Bible says Pharaoh sets him over all the land. You never know that the moment right before you're about to give up, God is setting you up for a miracle. The Bible lets us know that he puts some second in charge and says there is none other over you. See, even in the thing you hate, God can establish you because it's not about liking where you are. It's about being obedient to what he's called you to. Can I tell you, you need to get over your feelings about loving every place and situation and season you're in. And sometimes you just need to shut your mouth. Allow God to work the process and the plan over your life. Stop running to everything that pleases your flesh and that makes sense with what you had in your mind and say, God, not my will, but thy will be done. And the Bible says when we get to that point, God can use you in hostile situations to be a blessing because his plan is bigger than your sight. The Bible says that Joseph gets in front of all of Egypt and there's seven years of plenty and there's seven years of famine. And he doesn't know that he's being set up. The Bible lets us know Joseph gets to the point where he's serving in Egypt in the famine season and his brothers come to get food in Egypt. <laughs> this is good. Because oftentimes when you're holding on to the pettiness of the people that you think hurt you or try to destroy you, and you begin to let go and let God do what he knows how to do, God will bring the same people back to your foot. The Bible says, I'll, I'll set a place before your enemies. I'll seat you and set you in what? Heavenly places. The Bible says that his brothers come and here's where we pick up. In verse 1, it starts and it says, Then Joseph, having this moment of seeing his brothers, could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And the Bible says, we talked about this last week, it says, He cried. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And the Bible says, and he wept aloud. Sometimes you don't know this, but the reason you can't get over where you are is because you haven't gone through the grieving process to allow healing to begin so that you stop holding on to what is an ended season where God is replacing it with something new. It says, and when he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it, and it says, and Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near me, please. And they came near and he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve 
life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years. I know it's about to happen. Yet there are five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you. God sent me, even though you hurt me. God sent me, even though you neglected me. God sent me, even though you rejected me. God sent me, even though you sold me out. God sent me before you to preserve you. For you are remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. I want to get into the rest of this message. Let's, let's write this title down, The Purpose Behind Grief. There's a purpose behind your hurt. There's a purpose behind your past. There's a purpose behind what is, feels like a hard thing to swallow. Let's tell your neighbor, there's purpose behind grief. Father, in the name of Jesus, help us to understand the purpose behind what we have gone through. And help us not to just understand, but to grow. We don't want to stay where we are, but we want to be free by your name. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Can somebody say amen? Amen, amen. amen. God bless you. Thank you so much, musicians. Can y'all help me give it up for our dream team? Come on, our worship. Come on, y'all. Today has been a blessing. One of the things that I know to be true is oftentimes we have an opportunity to reflect on our lives when something ends in our life. I, as a pastor and as a minister, have found myself oftentimes being a part of homegoing celebrations. Now, I want to speak this because we are a mix of people. Now, uh, uh, us as African Americans, we have not funerals, but we have homegoing celebrations, which means it's going to take us a while to bury somebody because we got to celebrate every aspect of their life. We got to talk about little Johnny and, and, and how I loved him so dearly. We give our story about when we were on the playground at two years old and how we were close together and, 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 and we walk through what is a celebration not for the person who has not died, but as we say, passed away. When we look at what's taken place, we, we find ourselves in the moments of when there is lost that we reflect on where we are in life. Here's what I believe is that oftentimes, if you've ever been to a funeral, you start reflecting on things for your own life because you start to put into perspective, Lord, how much time do I have left? Can I be honest with you? If you've ever met a, 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 a good senior, I don't want to use that word, a seasoned, <laughs> can I use that word? A seasoned purpose, purpose person, I think the idea behind it is that when you greet them, they'll oftentimes give you a greeting back. How are you doing? It is good to be alive. What? Another day. You hear that oftentimes. It's, it's good to be where? Above what? Ground. Because there is something about the reflection of time that gives you clarity that says to yourself, I am grateful that I have the moments that I have to be able to do what I'm doing 
to be able to recognize that God is still being good to me. If I could pause right there, how many of you know that waking up today was not promised? How many of you know today that it was not assured? But how many of you know today that God woke you up? It was not your amazing long clock. It was not Alexa giving you an idea that you're supposed to get up. It was not your internal clock. It was God saying, uh, give him or her another breath today. And so we become reflective on the idea that life is precious. Do anybody know life is precious? And the loss of life oftentimes reminds us of that, unfortunately. When I think about Joseph and the extent of his life that he's gone through, here's the things that I begin to picture in my mind is that I notice that when we have gone through something in life, it has the opportunity to shape the very nature of who we are. If you stick with me this morning, I promise there's something that we're going to get out of this moment. I, I want you to understand that you've been shaped in your life. I know you and I each think we're all very pure, very good, we're, we're very on point with where we are, we've got everything together, but I want to let you know your mindset has been, your mindset has been shaped by the content of your past that's produced out of you a place of where you are. Many of you have found yourself, if you have been angry in life, there is something that has hurt you, that has made you angry. If you found yourself at a place in life where you're stressed, you probably have had people in your past that have stressed you out and, and they make everything fearful. Anybody ever been there before? You've got somebody that's scared of everything, and so you, yourself, are scared of everything. Your mama told you, don't touch that, don't look at that, come over here, don't cross the street, don't go over there, stay right here, move right here, look in my eye, don't you change over there, don't you go over, and everything has formed you so when you operate in life, you don't really know about risk because you don't have any scars. I'm getting somewhere. See, if, if, if I was to put some shorts on right now and, and if I was to show you my arm and, and if I was to show you other areas that you would know that my mother lost sight of me at some moment because what it said is she was not able to protect me over everything that I did. So I got some bruises and scratches and scars because I decided to take some risk in my life that I didn't know for about the risk that I took I thought was for my well-being but if I hadn't had the risk I might not have learned the lesson see there's something about being able to walk out what we believe God is saying in our hearts so that we can see the scars in our life scars teach us lessons Anybody got a scar that taught you a lesson? <laughs> anybody, anybody can look at that scar and be like, yeah, I remember that one. I remember I shouldn't have touched that. I remember I, I shouldn't even looked at that. Anybody got that scar? Anybody know that scar? Ladies, you know that scar when you burnt the, you know, you were trying to curl your hair. You got too close. You came back like, ah. I don't watch my wife come out. I said, what happened to you? The curlers. <laughs> it got me. My wife would give the curlers away, pass them off to our daughters. I was like, I'm not sure that is legacy that we need to be giving away. This burnt me, here you go. But the idea behind this is that our past is shaping 
our present, and if we don't watch it, it'll shape our future. Joseph has trauma, and Joseph's trauma leads him to the place where we, good Christians, let me, let me talk to my church people that's, that you've read Joseph before. You, you think Joseph is the golden angel. It don't get no better than Joseph, but, but when I started reading the Bible, I saw some inconsistencies. I saw that Joseph was a little arrogant up the top. Some of us got, we have some vision in our life. And God's put vision in us, but it's not a vision he told you to tell anybody about. You got a word from the Lord and you just started going big mouth on it. You know what the Lord told me? He going to use me. And ain't nothing going to stop me. The devil ain't going. And you just start giving it to everybody. Not understanding that the vision is not for now. It's for later. It's for a process you. Not a you where you are. You don't need to be arrogant about your vision that you got now because it's not even for a you that can handle it at the point you're in. God said he was going to use you, but not you. It's a different you. Tell somebody beside you, God's going to use a different you. Because you right now, you, you got a little attitude. You right now, you, you don't want to say nothing to nobody. You right now, you, you come in with a little chip on your shoulder. And God says, I'm calling you, but not you. I'm calling you, just not you. And the reason why you can't accept God's calling, because you agree with God. God, I, you're going to use me? He's like, yes, you, just not you. Because you're saying to yourself, if I'm looking at me now, and if I could respond to the vision God gave me, the person I am now doesn't match the person that God's calling me to be. So it must mean that if God has given me vision for something I don't see myself doing, then obviously it's not the me of now, it's the me after the process has taken me through. <laughs> Joseph got a little, a little arrogant, a little excited. Got himself in a pickle and his brother said, I'm about sick of you. See, when we start bragging only about the good areas of our life, People start taking offense because they don't feel like you're being fully real to the process. And all you keep showing is all the good points of your life instead of not showing that you've gone through some things, been through some things, uh, and where you are is not the product of what you did now. It's the product of your submission to God in your past. What you see on this stage now is the product of so much hurt and trials that I didn't give up on, not because I had the will to stay, but because I submitted to God who gave me the power to endure. That's why God's plan is never special for a special group of people. Everybody can achieve what God's called them to do if you submit to, somebody say, the process. Listen, you are just as amazing as the next person. Your issue is you won't give yourself over to the process so that you don't operate out of your brokenness and your weakness and you keep trying to fulfill a vision that's not about you but about the you later. Yeah. And many of us are getting frustrated because we can't see what God sees. Joseph, 15, around about, is arrogantly giving to his brothers, I am going to rule and you shall bow. <laughs> That's how some of us sound. And what he's saying is, is I might have got the vision. Ooh, God just said this in my heart. Some of you have giftings that you're not mature enough to handle. 
giving you the gift, but the gift must be matured in your life so that you don't mishandle what God is doing. Some of you are really good at what you do. You just don't know how to handle it because you need, somebody say maturity. Joseph goes through and he grows up. We think it's about 15 years or so, we say, until Joseph arrives at 30. Y'all know 30. You remember 30. 28. You was counting. Jesus is coming. 29 got here. People started giving you the wrong age. You was 29. They'd be like, you 30, right? I ain't 30. Don't say that. Don't be, don't, be, don't be pushing me ahead of my time. We got offended, didn't we? 30 came, you was ready to fight, give it over to somebody. You say I'm 30 again. I am 26. You there. Let's round up. Joseph gets to a place where he starts to mature. But here's the problem. Joseph is placed where God needs him to be. But the impact of Joseph's trauma has changed who he is. The Bible, if we really get into the chapters previous to 45, says that when the brothers first come to Joseph, they don't even recognize him because he's in Egyptian apparel and he's moving and operating like one who is of the land because he is. And the problem that we oftentimes have is that we don't notice, even though God is using us in the world, we're not to become like the world. See, Joseph was putting himself together, but Joseph had gotten so adjusted to the culture that now Joseph had a wife, Joseph looked like Egypt, Joseph talked the language like Egypt, and now here's the issue. We've got too many Christians fitting in too well. We're fitting in too well because here's what we're saying. Well, God's using me at my job, but the issue is, is God is using you at your job. He doesn't want you to be like your job. Can you handle God calling you into your purpose without denying who he is in your life? The Bible says, Joseph, we have this picture that Joseph has on all the garments and all the gear, and he starts to look like, and when his brothers come to them, he has no, they have no clue who Joseph is. Many times, can I, can I say this out loud? Many times, the identity that you have right now from your past is not your identity. Let me give you point number one. If you're not careful of understanding your purposeful design and learning and growing from your grief, point one, it can alter your identity. This is important. Because some of you have found yourself in places where you think this is who you are, and God is saying, that's never who I called you to be. I called you to be in control. I called you to be in charge. I called you to be great. I called you to be wealthy, but I never called you to be like the world. Your identity is lingering in your past hurt and in your past moments of trauma, anger, distant connection. Some of you have been coddled and you don't have an ability to believe by faith because your past gave you an identity that safety is more important than your growth. So in your coddling state, 
You believe everything, if I'm going to get deep, I'm going to get, you believe everything is supposed to be handed to you and that work is optional and that you don't have to look within yourself or work on yourself in order to see a you grow into the godly person. That's why we have men and women who are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, yet they still act like they're 15. Bad attitudes, can't get over stuff, tantrums, I didn't get my way, I don't like it, I'm not going back to that church, they won't let me sit on my row. I'm going to talk about this every week until you come in here and sit down, every week. <laughs> and it set me up front, I'm coming late, that's why I came late, pastor. My seat was not open. Get over yourself. We don't owe you no seat. Charles, yet you still get that same seat every time. <laughs> Charles, tell him, come early then. That's all you got to do. But the truth of the matter is, what we're finding out is that many of our identities are the result of our trauma that's unhealed. And so while we are supposed to learn from our grief, we've stayed in our grief and it's become our identity. If you notice, Joseph does not reveal his true self until he emotionally grieves. The you that you want to see happen is inside waiting to come out, but it's got to be truthful with what's taking place on the inside. I've got dad issues. I've got abandonment issues. I have issues of people leaving me and not nobody supporting me. I have walls up because trauma in my past. Somebody hurt me. Somebody touched me. Somebody put me in a place where I don't want to be. And it has made me into a person. I love God, but I'm going to do it my way. That's what we have. Christians who do it their way, yet we say my obedience is to God. And here's where I got to get you. You can't be in and of the world. It's changed your identity. You don't feel uncomfortable when you're in the environment of the world because you're used to operating in the world with religious obedience. I got, I got saved, so I'm going to do what the Bible tells me out of ritual, not out of obedience. It's not love. I just don't want to go to hell. Can I get real, real? So I try to find the least common denominator that gets me right on the lion, but doesn't require any sacrifice. So when the Bible says don't get drunk, is that one drink, two drink? When it tells us really don't be under the influence, is that one puff, two puffs, or three puffs? You're, you're trying to piece it together because you're living out of the trauma of, you're not going to tell me what to do. <laughs> but you don't understand, it's transformed your identity. I get you. You're successful. You're making the money. You're doing well. But the issue is, is while you're ruling a kingdom like Joseph, you're still broken on the inside. Because you have never gotten the healing that God called you to get. 
The scripture lets us know <laughs> in 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, it says, in this you rejoice, though, though, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in <laughs> praise and glory. Can I stop right here? The reason it's a little hard for you to get up when the worship team says, let's magnify the Lord together, is because there is a grief that you have let set in your heart that keeps you from being able to release easily so that you can do what? Praise and glory. It doesn't take anything for me to magnify the Lord. I don't care if my lights are off or not, mortgage paid or not. It doesn't matter if the car is paid or not. I will bless the Lord at all times and it's, I'll preach to the screen if I need to. I will bless the Lord because I understand my trials are small in comparison to the greatness of who he is. Praise and glorify him in the midst of trouble. Praise and glorify him when there's a wrong report. Praise and glorify him even in the midst that hell is breaking loose. I want to know, does anybody have something uh, greater than an artificial praise? Well, since you made me, well, since I got to be here, well, since it's another Sunday, but I have learned through various trials, whether they have grieved me or not, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually, 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 continually be in my mouth. I bless him. I give him praise. I glorify him. He's been too good. Glory to God, glory to God. <laughs> I know people look at my, when my wife and I are here in this worship time, we up in here like dancing and we just, it's like, what, are they, what is wrong with them? Aren't they pastors? Yes, because we've been through some trials and we've already declared our yes. So it doesn't determine anything that happens in my life. I will bless the Lord. Bad report, I don't care. Mortgage, I don't care. Situations, I don't care. I will praise and glorify the name of the Lord. I'm not in and out of this thing. I'm not switching in and out when it feels comfortable. I'm not in and out according to my level of where I want to be. And then, sit down, sit down. It's a little bit of my edge. It's a little bit of my edge. When I was going through six years of dialysis and I prayed for God to do a miracle, he said, the miracle will be that I'm going to keep you through it. And then when I bring you out, you will tell of my story. The issue is, is that from a little bit of it, can I be, can I be transparent? From a little bit of it, it made me a little hard and not as empathetic at times to people who take a decision to have a break. So my team <laughs> will often talk about pastor. They call me Pharaoh. That's what, if we want to be honest, they call me Pharaoh. And it's like, why don't you stop? It's because of what came out of my trauma. Can, can, we, can we talk? Like my trauma that ended up in good circumstances to be able to be used still had negative impact if I don't learn from it. 
It doesn't matter if it brought you out and now you're more conscious than ever. And, but if it left a mark that can't heal while you are in the favor and will of God, you will still curse, slight people, smack them. And what you will say is, it's okay. I'm not as bad as everybody else. Two heart surgeries later, it's not the outside heart that I've got to work on. It's the inside heart. Because while it was used for the glory of God, we love that all things work together for the good. But while it was used for God's glory, it can still leave me in a traumatic space. Don't get twisted that because you're in God's will that you don't need work. Tell your neighbor, we all need work. <laughs> you won't be honest. We, we all need work. Standing on this platform or not, we all need work. When we don't recognize oftentimes that it will shift our identity, point number two is that it can create unhealthy patterns. There will be things that you find from your trauma that you will cope with. There are things from your life that you will find that from where you are, you will learn to put in solutions and patterns and pieces of your life that keep you where you are so that you don't go off the edge. Yet and still while doing the will of the Lord. Because oftentimes we can find ourselves developing bad patterns. I don't want an unhealthy pattern that is attached to me that I feel does not allow me to live the freedom that God has called for me to live because I need it as a substitute to my broken life. The scripture says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Mm. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, his pleasing, and his what? Perfect will. When I create unhealthy patterns in my life, I will find myself being manipulative in spaces and things because of the information that I know seems to be greater than the information that someone else knows. The Bible lets us know that literally for an entire conversation, Joseph manipulated everything. He came in and didn't tell them who he was. They came looking, and then Joseph invited them in. He invited them in, and then he questioned them. He questioned them, and then he said to them he was a little harsh with them. And if he was a little harsh to them, then he put one of his own brothers in jail. You can be manipulative in your follow with Jesus because you have not been healed from the trauma that you have. You'll be so manipulative that you will convince yourself that what you're doing is good, even though it's not biblically true. And you will stay where you are from the point of view that because God is using me, I must be okay. Can I tell you God is more interested in the people than he is in exposing only the person? The reason why God may keep using you is because he understands he needs to get something across to you that me, myself, does not have the ability to handle. So God says, you know what? I'll use you, but you'll stay where you are in the manipulative state. And what I will do is isolate you where you are so that you feel no comfort around you for the weightiness of the task that I've given you. Some of us are doing great things alone. Wow. Wow. Yeah, good. Yeah. 
Because the circle around you won't be manipulated. And you think because God's using you that everyone should follow you. The Bible says that Joseph manipulates. He puts his brother in jail. He puts money back in the sacks. Nobody, we loved Joseph, didn't we? Pastor, you done messed up my view of Joseph. I, I, Joseph was manipulative. He knew they were going to have to come back and get more. So he put a brother in jail. He put their money back in their sack. By the time they got home, they were anxious, worried about the flip out because they saw their gold back in their sacks. They went to their father and said, we lost another brother. The father is almost about to have a stroke and die. Then they said, we've got to go back to Egypt to get more. The father says, you're not going and you're not taking my son. They said, if you, he told us, if we don't bring Benjamin back, then we can't come. There is an, a catastrophe only because Joseph manipulated the circumstance. He could have said from the beginning, it's me. But because he didn't know his identity and he had not walked through the process of grief and he did not have a healing mind to be able to release the lies and stop walking in the deception that the enemy had placed over his eyes, he's up here what? Playing games. God brought me here to tell you stop playing games and get free so that you can walk into the purpose that God has for your life. Nobody's impressed by your little smooth attitude. Nobody's impressed that you got a mean mug. You need to get, somebody say freedom. Because if you don't get the freedom, you will continue to manipulate the process. Stop creating patterns for your unhealthy living. Tell your neighbor, just be honest. No, 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 seriously, tell your neighbor, just be honest. We just got to be honest. Are you in a good place? No. Do you need help? Yes. Stop trying to dress it up with more clothes and more cars and more money and more businesses and more houses. Stop trying. Oh, can I get this one? And more degrees. Your degree ain't going to cover your brokenness. You broke. You're going to be manipulative with a degree or without. But if you could get freedom, somebody say freedom, freedom, then I could walk in everything that God has for me and let the chips fall where they are. I'm not here to impress you. I love you, but I ain't here to impress you. I'm not here to take myself through trauma just to say I got something. I am here for God to use me just as I am. So you don't have to manipulate everything to be in your favor. The reason you have to manipulate is because you don't trust who you are. So you create a different person. You're creating somebody you wish you could be when God says, I can make you it if you would stop lying. You keep lying. Thinking it's impressive. You keep lying. Thinking somebody's going to be, no, no, it is what it is. And God's going to work on what it is so that I can be who he's called me to be. But some of us need to drop the lies. Somebody told me, Pastor, you don't post a lot or you don't put it. You need to, that's what my social media team would tell me. You need to put up more. I said, I don't need to put up more because I don't want to show anybody more. They said, well, you got to do it for the purpose of the church. I said, I can tell the church what's going on, but the truth of the matter is nobody really wants to hear the truth. What today look like? I am tired out my mind. I'm going home and I'm eating pizza. What you going to do? Judge me. Because now judgment keeps me from becoming who I'm called to be. So instead of thinking about your judgment, I'm going to do me. And when you see me at the end and you're like, what happened to him? What you'll notice is that I didn't need to front for you. <laughs> Care what you know? God's called me in the purpose. I, I'm sorry. It's who I am. I'm not making it up. I'm not fronting. I'm not putting it on. So when you come, this is me. Tell your neighbor, this is me. 
or at least it's going to beat me one, one of these days. It's going to beat me. But this is me. Some of y'all keep it up with stuff. You, I'm all over. Yeah, hold on. Wrong light. Put the, I'll be like, take the picture. It's what I look like. Crazy hair, crazy eyes. It don't matter. Take the picture. And then I send it to our photographer and be like, edit that right there. Can you deal with what shows up without modifying it and work on that instead of trying to work on the modified modified? We're taking a lot of time giving people something and then trying to work on ourselves behind closed doors. You're just going to see it straight up. What happened today? My sister will tell me, I'm eating good. And then my sister will be like, Pastor, you, I'll be like, give me some chips now. But you're not supposed to be on, I, did you hear what I said? I want you to see in front that there are low moments and high moments. Because guess what? At the end of the day, it helps me be true to me. Let me, let, well, hold, before we go there, because we love this true to me, me foolishness. Because I'm just being me. I, I, nobody asked you to be me. Let's, let's get into the gospel real quick. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you'll do what? Take up your cross. Do what? Follow. Ain't nobody on their cross talking about doing them. So let's get that gospel straight. Doing me means I've submitted. And doing me is doing him. So let's clear that up. So we don't go out there and I get a clip from creative talking about, pastor said, do you? Okay, all right. All right, that have messed up the whole thing. And point number three is that if you don't watch and understand the purpose behind your grief, it, can dis it, it literally can hide the greater purpose. The... The Bible said that he said, Joseph, God put me here for, for this reason. It wasn't just a good scripture cliche. All things work together for the good. It was really, this is working together for the good, even though I never saw it this way. Sometimes we haven't recognized, but what God is doing in your life was never about you. you. You got hooked up in the salvation plan idea that what God was doing was to better you and yours. If, if you actually go in scripture, <laughs> it's weird because through Joseph, he saves Israel, but they also end up in bondage. He didn't see it coming. Some of us are at the point in our life where we're saying to ourselves, what God is trying to do through me is about me. And I'm here today to let you know, it's not about you. It's about him. Matthew chapter 5 verse 14 says this. You are the world's light. You. You're supposed to shine. Not with the candle that you lit. With the light of Christ that he lit. The Bible says that he brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Tell your neighbor real quick, you're the light. You're not the light of yourself. You're not the light that is supposed to shine about what you do where you are. You're the light that people are supposed to look to for refuge. The idea is that there's a context that many times we saw them, that there were people on the sea and they were looking for a place to lodge, looking for a place to go, and they would look for where the light is. Some people in your community have been looking for a light and you have been so consumed in you 
that you never decided to allow God to flicker on, but you dimmed it. How many people are stranded in the sea because there was no light to come to? How many of your family and friends will you watch be lost because you won't turn on your light? How much does this world need to consume of your time and your effort for you to prove through your looks and through your clothes and through your ideas of what is good and what is amazing? How many people are stranded in the water? How much of Baltimore is missing you because you won't turn on your light? The scripture says, you are the world's light, a city on a hill glowing in the night for all to see. <laughs> Jesus is saying, when will you turn your light on? Your light's going to cost you because at the slightest distraction, your light could go out. At the slightest wind, you see the light flicker. When you start seeing the light flicker, you need some people that are around you that remind you you are more than a conqueror. Don't you get distracted. Don't you get off purpose. Don't you get off focus. God has planned for your life to take. But I need you to understand at all costs, protect your light. If you can't protect your light, I'm not sure the impact that you think you're going to make is going to be that amazing. For while you'll have a stack of money, you will not be a light for people to draw to. You'll be a place for people just to envy. I don't want to make people envious. I want people to look at me and say, what must I do? to have what you have. If he changed me, he can change you. But you have to know the purpose behind your grief. Can we thank God for the